This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. panel uh, is led by Claire Brindis. Uh, this is a, a panel that will tackle some of the uh, population level uh, uh, research that's uh, here at UCSF. Claire is obviously a, a great leader in adolescent and women's issues, um, in policy. So Claire, take over. Thank you very much, Paul. And I also want to thank Paul and Jaime and Richard and um, <laughs> Uh, George um, and Eric, really, because this panel is very exciting. And it, for me, the fact that at the leadership of GHS and in the celebration of 10 years, we acknowledge the importance of social, behavioral, policy, economics as being the DNA of all of the projects that you heard about today. I was really struck by a number of the uh, themes that we've already heard in terms from Nisha and Susan and Dabrowski, because um, my interest in maternal and child health, I would have never thought about worms in maternal and child health, so thank you very much for that. Um, what I've, when thinking about this panel, and I'm really excited to introduce to you our colleagues, um, what I wanted to do was something a little bit different, which is, you know, we're almost at lunchtime, so I want to keep you uh, well fed in terms of your intellectual ideas. But this is really a bookend, meaning that Eric gave us this amazing vision at really not only 60,000 feet above, but really maybe many, many more feet above. And in a way, our panel and what I have asked each of the speakers in a very short period of time is to really give us a sense about the directions for population health. Where are we going with the social behavioral sciences that are occurring at UCSF? How do we do the translational process from the research that takes place at the bench, at the clinical, and the policy, and the behavioral and social sciences? And how do we really think about that vision impacting global population health? Because in reality, we're all in this together because we want to advance and improve the health of so many millions of individuals all across the world. Um, so you'll be hearing about some of these issues that are emerging and touching upon the work that each of these wonderful professionals have been doing over many, many decades of work. So I'll introduce to you very briefly, because there's a write-up for you, but um, the first speaker is Kirsten Bibbins-Domingo, who is a, both a, um, a cardiovascular epidemiologist and internist, and she does incredibly interesting work around population studies that bring in a variety of methodologies. She herself is a Renaissance woman and has been doing a lot of work not only in the US but in Mexico, Argentina, Chile, and China, looking at issues of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and stroke. So please welcome her. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to be here. It's great to be amongst uh, wonderful colleagues and to hear the inspiring talks from this morning. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, population perspectives, as uh, Claire uh, mentioned. And my particular area looks uh, at what we call here in global health non-communicable diseases. We call in our center chronic diseases. It doesn't matter what you call them, they're common. They're costing us a lot in this country. They're costing us a lot globally. The big four we talk about, cardiovascular disease, cancers, pulmonary disease, and diabetes alone make up the majority of uh, the leading cause of deaths worldwide. And remember that 80% of these deaths occur in low and middle income countries. That doesn't even include the things you heard Susan talk about in terms of mental health and musculoskeletal conditions, which of course are also um, included as uh, chronic non-communicable conditions that are a major source of uh, death and disability. 
importantly here, this is, uh, this is not just a, an aging of the populations, as you know. 25% uh, of deaths in low and middle income countries are occurring from these conditions in people under age 65. So that has a major impact not only on how we think about uh, um, health, but also how we think about development. Because when you shift uh, epidemiology of these conditions to younger ages, that of course has a major impact. And uh, that is an, an issue that we in our center have been working to try to address and to try to think through what that means in terms of decisions both nationally and in other global contexts. So as you know, a feature of these chronic conditions is that they're largely preventable with attention to risk factors, and that approaches to prevention require both clinical and public health types of interventions. Public health becomes important because of the pervasiveness of risk um, here, especially in countries undergoing the epidemiological transition, and because of limited capacity for clinical infrastructure to address both prevention and management of these chronic conditions. But that being said, what I want to focus us on is really what the questions are. What are the research questions in this domain? And how does research and partnerships, global partnerships, how can we advance discussions in these areas? So the area that I focus on in particular is cardiovascular disease. And the reality is we know how to prevent cardiovascular disease. These are the seven, the AHA's simple seven, right? If we could do this, we would all prevent cardiovascular disease worldwide. If you look at the World Health Organization's best buys, they're all around the things that would have the greatest impact would include a nutritious diet would include lowering uh, sodium in the diet to maintain a normal blood pressure, tobacco. All of these things are things that we know. So what's the problem? The problem is uh, that when we think about how we implement these in other contexts, one size doesn't fit all. And that's probably an area that has received very little attention when we think about how to actually implement these strategies in different countries. So there's very different epidemiology of cardiovascular disease depending on the countries that you look at. And for countries that are making trade-offs, making decisions both on clinical and on a public health basis, understanding these trade-offs in a particular national context becomes critically important. Should you focus on smoking or should you focus on preventing diabetes? Now, we'd like to do all of these things, but in some countries it's very clear that your best bang for the buck is a focus on tobacco, and in others where diabetes rates are extremely high, that's where the greatest uh, benefit is likely to, to uh, would have the greatest benefit. The other differences uh, in these contexts is also clinical capacity. And this uh, um, really informs the trade-off of whether public health approaches versus clinical-based approaches are really the best strategies when we think about uh, preventive efforts in this regard. Also, another area that we're very interested in is that uh, when we think particularly about public health prevention strategies, that regional focuses are likely to be as important as national, uh, a, a national focus. And that's because many things that affect both tobacco policy and food policy um, really impact uh, um, companies and uh, decisions that, uh, that can be tackled better on a regional basis than perhaps on a purely uh, local or national basis. And so this is the work that we do. We, uh, we work with the cardiovascular disease policy model. This is a dynamic population-based computer simulation of heart disease and stroke in US adults. That's how it was initially designed. Um, and we've been working for many decades on this particular model. And the model now integrates diabetes, other types of risk um, as, uh, into the model as well as we've grown. What we have done over the last several years is to adapt the CVD policy model to other national contexts. And we've done this through active collaborations with investigators in these countries who become part of our CVD policy model commons. Our goal in these collaborations is to identify investigators who are interested in, um, in being active partners with us, who want to use the model to address a particular question of interest in their, in their particular context, and for us to really provide the technical expertise in this model to use it as a tool then to help uh, decision makers uh, um, e examine the types of choices that are, might be at stake in that particular context. 
So uh, this is this is the our how we have identified collaborators, and uh, it's really uh, been something that was initiated by. Um, Lee Goldman, when he was the chair here in medicine, and uh, has been a very rich uh, source of collaborations now for many years. Our interest, although we have started with partnering with individual countries, over time what's happened is a real uh, growth of our regional collaborations and partnering with the Pan American Health Organization. That's led to more uh, collaborations within other countries. And we're interested in the regional collaborations and looking at both variations across different national contexts, as well as synergies uh, that might uh, result from examining the same types of interventions in a variety of different settings. So what do you do with this computer simulation? Well, the computer simulation is good for evaluating the health and economic impact of new treatments and algorithms for examining population-wide versus targeted interventions, for looking at trends in risk factors and demographic shifts, because this is a dynamic population-based model that looks at shifts in the population, for doing forecasting of future demographic trends. We are interested in the health of subgroups to examine inequities, comparisons of different clinical and public health interventions, and uh, comparisons of treatment versus prevention strategies. So in the other context, our active collaborators have been really in China, in Argentina, in Mexico, and in Chile. And uh, we've been very happy that these have been ongoing now for several years. And particularly in the Americas, uh, these are uh, collaborations that we hope will continue to expand. So I'm going to describe two types of work that we've been doing to just give you a flavor of the, the, the way in which we've approached this. So this is uh, examining demographic trends related to cardiovascular disease in the US and in China. So this is work of uh, my colleague, Michelle Auden, who is now a professor at Oregon Health Sciences. And she was very interested in the baby boomers and the effect on cardiovascular disease in the US context. And this is showing that from 2010 to 2040, that um, because of these baby boomers, we will not only have more uh, cardiovascular uh, disease prevalence, um, but that we will have it across all of the age spectrums, really. Um, and, uh, and this is an important as one thinks about planning for, um, for health services in the US. She was interested in looking at what are the factors that would modulate uh, this projected rise in um, coronary heart and uh, cardiovascular disease in the US. And what you see in the dotted lines, what you see in the, the solid line is the trend line for uh, if things stay the same. And what you see, oh, sorry, what you see in the dotted line, what you see in the dotted line uh, where it's rising is if the current trends in BMI continue to rise as we would project they will. So although there's a rise in prevalence that's just due to the baby boomers, uh, that probably understates what is likely to be the true rise in cardiovascular disease in the US because of the rising rates of obesity. We have also examined this in terms of adolescent obesity and found the same types of projections. And of course, in the US context, the shifting uh, burden of uh, obesity to younger ages has implications not only for health, but also for how we think about economic development. And this is true in, in all contexts, of course. When we think about the impact of adolescent obesity in the US, and the future costs in terms of this obesity, we know that this will lead to a rise in direct healthcare costs from treating obesity-related illnesses, but also, more importantly, um, costs related to lost wages because of premature deaths that result from shifting the cardiovascular disease epidemic to younger ages, as well as wages lost from disability. So this is an example of uh, an analysis we did in the US. And it came uh, at the same time that we were starting collaborations with investigators in uh, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Vessel Institutes in Beijing. And so China was very interested in the same types of analyses. And you know that there's a lot of um, uh, regional variations and uh, transitions uh, from rural to urban in, in China that has resulted in the same types of rise in um, both obesity and other cardiovascular uh, risk factors. And what you see here is the projections then in China for coronary heart disease deaths and at what age they're occurring. So these are likely to rise over time. 
and, uh, and you can see the division between those that occur in people over 65 and those under 65. Importantly, um, the dollies that are associated with this, um, with this rising burden of coronary heart disease are really going to be concentrated in those under 65, which again have really important implications for how we think about um, both uh, the health of a country and the economic development implications of a younger age at disease onset. These, uh, these projections uh, assume that the current rates of uh, risk factors stay the same. If they're projected to rise, these rates are even worse than what anticipates. And one thing uh, that's important when one thinks about different national contexts is that uh, the cardiovascular disease epidemic in China really is one that is focused uh, to a very large extent on ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke which also shifts how one thinks about the strategies for tackling this. If one were to put these same types of graphs up for the US, what you would see is that coronary heart disease would dominate and not stroke. And uh, that, again, uh, sort of results in a, a differing approach to thinking about cardiovascular disease prevention. Our collaborators in China are really interested in this trade-off. China has expanded secondary care for cardiovascular disease quite considerably. And, uh, and really, we, when we were there a year ago at this time, really quite uh, tremendous facilities for secondary care of stroke and, and coronary heart disease. However, the, the attention has not focused as much on primary prevention, and so our investigators, our collaborators are actively looking at the trade-offs of what this means to do primary versus secondary prevention for this growing burden. I'm going to quickly run through our work on, on uh, sodium and, and uh, sugar. Um, and uh, this is some work in the US showing if we could, we're all eating too much salt. I'm going to tell you that before you break for lunch. Um, this is what we would, what would uh, be the resulted benefits in terms of heart attacks reduced if we could lower the sodium in our diet in the U.S. And in our analyses, when we look at two types of public health interventions, sodium reduction and uh, tobacco cessation, um, those actually uh, result in the same overall population impact. And uh, that tells us, again, what the World Health Organization told us, that these are two best buys. These are two great strategies for helping to reduce cardiovascular disease. And in fact, across the population would result in about uh, equivalent numbers of deaths reduced. Our collaborators in Argentina, to reduce sodium in the diet, you have to know where sodium is in the diet in your country, right? And our collaborators in Argentina said, well, sodium in the Argentine diet is in bread. And we know who makes the bread. We know how to intervene on the people who make the bread. Bread is bought fresh in, in Argentina regularly. So they intervened directly on the bakeries. They went to the bakeries, and they got the bakers to reduce sodium in the bread just a little bit. And what they found was that uh, basically the bakers did it. People didn't notice that the bakers had done it, and people started eating less salt. And so this is really wonderful work that they have done now to actually uh, describe the impact of this intervention, really understanding the local context and understanding how one would implement what we know works, uh, which is reducing salt in the diet. And this is a, um, a publication, th their first publication there, there have actually been three publications on this particular work um, just showing you can prevent, you can gain a lot of qualities doing this, you can reduce a lot of coronary disease events, and if you could expand this to a larger scale, you would get even more benefit. So in the U.S. diet, in Western diets, most of the salt is already in processed or pre-prepared foods. 80% um, of that. So we don't have the luxury in many countries of actually going to work directly with the bakers because we're buying this already prepackaged from large multinational companies. And there's a lot of variation in how much salt is in these same foods. So this is just from fast food restaurants showing that, um, that the same Big Mac actually has way more sodium in Canada than it does in the UK. So Big Macs are not inherently salty. It really, regional variation is quite, uh, quite common. And that's led to collaborations with the Pan American Health Organization to think about sharing information across the region when one thinks about public health strategies both for understanding how Argentina did it well, but also for advocating across the region how you leverage um, regional power to advocate with food companies to get them to reduce sodium in the diet. 
The same type of approach that we, uh, uh, PAHO has been using to try to think also about um, uh, partnering on, on taxation of sugary beverages. This is something that our modeling group has been working on for a while, and Mexico beat us to it and, uh, in, tax, in taxing sugary beverages. And uh, this is something that we are really excited to be working with them to, to look at both economic and health impacts as well as we think in San Francisco debate the same policy issue. So this is my last slide. Um, we're really excited to have received a, an R03 from, the, from Fogarty for continuing our work in Mexico. And this summer, we'll be offering a, a course on cardiovascular disease prevention, implementation science, and public policy at the National Institute of Public Health. This will include investigators from here, as well as our collaborators from Argentina. Um, and uh, again, uh, we're, we're really excited. This has been a really uh, a wonderful and very rich collaboration, and we have many common interests, both from interventions as well as the technical pieces. Um, PAHO has been interested in the modeling and economic analysis to use this as a basis to try to provoke, promote certain prevention strategies, and we've been working actively in some of their uh, technical documents they're preparing. And across the region, an, another area I focus more on public health interventions, but we've been very interested in uh, provision of statin medications and how one might use different approaches depending on your particular context. All right. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, our next speaker is Alvin Gang, who will discuss the, um, the growing role of implementation science in the global response to HIV, AIDS, and illustrate with some examples of the research he's been carrying out, modeling clinical and public health interventions addressing the global epidemic of cardiovascular disease. Thanks. <clears throat> so uh, good uh, morning, I guess it's still morning. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today. And um, before I get started, I just wanted to say in my sort of um, growing and nascent career in research that, you know, it's really become apparent that the relationships um, are both critical to achieving the, the research goals, but also um, in and of themselves are the most rewarding aspects of this, this work. And um, I have the great fortune of um, many mentors who have guided this work um, at UCSF and um, overseas, as well as I want to acknowledge um, a cohort of peers um, that I've started to work more intensively with and um, it, with whom I, I draw a lot of inspiration and includes you know, Gabe, uh, Shamian, and Vivek in my division, Adithya uh, in pulmonary, um, and others, Thomas Odeni in Kenya, um, and, and others. So I just wanted to put that out there first. So um, very briefly, over the last 30 years, I think this goes without saying in, 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 in this audience, but over the last 30 years, HIV treatment has become highly efficacious. It's become robust to resistance, tolerable, co-formulated, and minimally toxic, although there still are toxicities. We also know a lot about strategies for how to use it, when to use it, um, at what CD4 count, and at, at what time in relation to opportunistic infections. Um, we also know an increasing amount about HIV prevention. So uh, adult male circumcision reduces HIV acquisition, um, pre-exposure prophylaxis, mother-to-child transmission, and even behavioral uh, incentives to reduce HIV incidence. Um, with, along with these efficacious interventions, over the last decade, global investment in the response to HIV has also grown dramatically. And this slide is taken from the Kaiser Family Foundation and shows um, in billions of dollars uh, donor government investment in HIV. Um, and this has really changed the landscape of the global epidemic. The presence of efficacious treatments and resource commitments um, have made this global response possible. Um, and 10 million people have accessed ART globally. But while tremendous progress has been made, gaps remain. And, um, and that is the topic and focus of this area. Um, of implementation science. So how do we translate um, evidence and commitment in terms of resources into real world practices? So as an illustration, this is taken from a UN, a graphic taken from a, a UN AIDS um, report. Even with this massive enterprise, um, the fraction of people in immediate need of antiretroviral therapy who are being reached with it 
um, in different regions of the world is still far from optimal. And so in the far um, left column, uh, it, these figures show the gap. So the fraction of people who uh, need antiretroviral therapy who are not receiving it. And you can see that um, although there's variability across regions, um, there is no region in which we can say that uh, coverage is, is complete. So many people have approached this problem um, scientifically, I think, in different terms. And one of the ways of formulating this problem now is with this term implementation science. So I was just going to read what I thought was a definition of implementation science as being widely accepted um, to frame the scientific, the next generation of scientific questions. Um, so from the journal Implementation Science, it says, implementation research is the scientific study of methods to promote systematic uptake of clinical research findings and other evidence-based practices into routine practice. Um, in the context of the global response to HIV, therefore, I think this can be translated into, uh, broadly speaking, these three questions. So what is the magnitude of the gap between evidence and practice? What is the impact of the global response to HIV on productivity, quality of life, survival, et cetera? And what are the determinants of this gap um, at the level of the community, the patient, the provider, the organization, um, and policy? And finally, what are generalizable strategies to close this gap? So what interventions or strategies can be applied generally um, to promote uh, the uptake and use of these interventions. And broadly speaking, the uh, research that I've been involved in um, with various collaborators have tried to target these three questions in, in succession. So um, to begin with, I think we started to ask the question of what is, what is the impact? And um, it, in HIV implementation, the cascade of care is now sort of thought of as, as a common heuristic to understand the success of implementation. And from various systematic reviews um, and many studies, uh, the cascade is sort of summarized here. So from, infect, from diagnosis to staging to eligibility to ART initiation and to retention, um, the figures that are presented and that are prevailing um, don't look uh, a great. Um, but before we sort of take the next step, we thought it would be wise to revisit where these estimates come from and what implications they, they might have. So most of these estimates come from administrative databases, national databases, or clinic-based cohorts in resource-limited settings in Africa. And because HIV care scaled up rapidly in a setting without integrated um, care systems or information systems, um, many patients uh, become lost to follow-up, and lost to follow-up patients are often considered um, to be outside the system or lost to care. So we thought that if you look more closely, among all patients, those lost to follow-up most likely include patients who have died, as well as those patients who have disengaged in care, um, as well as patients who are in care elsewhere within the system. And that finding out what happened to those lost patients might influence critically what we think about the magnitude of outcomes. Um, and to take this approach, we first looked in Uganda, in, in southwestern Uganda, with our collaborators at the Embraer University of Science and Technology um, uh, at this problem. So taking a um, sample of patients in clinic, we thought, OK, there are many who continue in care, but many who don't come back and are lost to follow up. If we're able to identify a random sample of those patients and to look intensively for them, we can use a probability weight to then essentially fill in the blanks and give us an unbiased estimate of what happens to all the patients in clinic rather than make assumptions about their outcomes. So one of the things that we found um, first was that using this approach, mortality was very much underestimated. Um, the dotted line shows the approach that's customarily taken where you assume patients, you, you report deaths among the patients in whom you know the deaths about. Um, after incorporating the outcomes among the lost patients, uh, the magnitude of mortality rose um, several fold. Um, interestingly, we also found that the estimates of retention were underestimated as well. Um, many patients who are lost to follow up from a particular clinic setting turn out to be in care elsewhere. And to some extent, that's expected because the system of care is growing and therefore points of contact with the system also grow. 
Um, so using uh, the approach that's commonly taken where lost patients are considered gone, um, the black line shows what we sort of call the naive estimate of retention. And the red and blue are, are revised using the, the, the outcomes among those lost. Now, there's a difference between the red and the blue because we could only ask about care among patients that you found in person, whereas patients reported alive by an informant, we couldn't ask those questions without potentially inadvertently exposing HIV status. So these are the bounds of the sensitivity analysis. Um, in either case, uh, the estimate of retention is actually higher than, um, qualitatively higher than, than, than outcomes without uh, accounting for the lost. And then finally, we looked at epidemiologic analyses um, to, uh, of predictors for mortality. And um, the losses will influence both the magnitude of the outcomes that are sought as well as predictors. Um, and so uh, without accounting for the lost, you can see here that um, certain factors um, which were significant, like male sex, become not significant. And then other factors such as um, age go from being uh, not significant to significant. So we, we felt like this approach um, was a generalizable strategy to ascertain outcomes. And we wanted to use it to better understand reasons. Um, it's, it's not, we felt that the settings were heterogeneous enough such that outcomes likely differ between sites. So our inferences were not so much about um, you know, the particular outcome or the particular risk factor associated with the outcome, but rather about the utility of this approach in many settings. And so with subsequent funding, we um, wanted to explore using this approach to quantify differences in outcomes across sites in East Africa um, and within an epidemiologic consortia um, in Uganda, Tanzania, and, um, and Kenya. We, we also um, sought to understand reasons by survey of patients who are out of care, direct survey, as well as in-depth qualitative interviews to derive um, a better uh, overall picture of the reasons. So here is um, the estimates of mortality across five programs in 14 clinics um, in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. And even though this particular graph does not show um, estimates adjusted for baseline CD4 count, I can tell you that the adjusted estimates look very similar. In other words, after accounting for biological drivers of mortality, like CD4 count and TB status at the start of therapy, there is a notable difference in mortality, which point to potentially differences in the way that care is delivered. Um, and we felt like that this hetero heterogeneity, which is not surprising um, given that whenever people have looked at um, care or outcomes across sites, that heterogeneity um, is very prominent. So uh, when we found patients who were not in care, we asked them a question. It was derived from a behavioral model, um, and their responses were coded into categories. And here's just a flavor of what people said. Um, so um, working elsewhere, um, somebody felt like he was asked to join a support group and it was a waste of time. The husband ran into legal trouble. Um, somebody else felt that their condition was good and they didn't see any reason for continuing to get care. So we categorized these reasons across um, site and across step in the cascade um, into three sort of dimensions, structural reasons, healthcare setting reasons, and knowledge, beliefs, and attitudes. And again, we found that in general, heterogeneity was the hallmark of of, of, of the responses. So um, across different settings and across different countries, there are differences, and then also across steps in the cascade, although less so, um, um, illustrating the diversity of barriers that people receive when they get to care. So putting all this together, I thought that, um, that um, sort of a case presentation sort of brings all these data together. So here's a very typical example of um, a case. So 39-year-old woman start, has a CD4 count that's in the 200s um, and starts and enrolls in care and then misses a scheduled appointment some months later because uh, the brother died and, and, and she gave money for the burial. Um, subsequent to that, because the patient had been unwell, uh, she had less resources to make up for that immediate expense. Um, and she needed to borrow money to get to clinic. Um, of course, by the time she borrowed money, her visit had lapsed. And when she got to clinic, she was told to come back the next week. 
um, because she couldn't be seen without a visit. She came back the next week, but was still not seen, had an argument with the staff, and decided to stop coming. And here's the quote. So at times, you've missed your appointment date. And when you come back, the doctor looks at you with such a bad eye that you even fear explaining more to her. She tells you, stop disturbing me. Today is not your appointment date. And she stands and walks away. At times, I do not blame them. Maybe they're hungry or tired. If they could start providing lunch to the doctors and have many more doctors, they would not have to be overworked. Maybe this would help. So, so you know, putting all this together, we, we, came, we, we frame this as sort of a multi-hit explanatory framework for retention and care. So um, there are structural delivery and psychosocial barriers to care. And in any given case, different factors, um, uh, there's a confluence of different factors that lead to an episode of leaving care. And so um, in this case, she had insufficient personal resources, failure to find transportation were structural issues, delivery issues, she had a quarrel with the staff, um, worker burnout was a delivery issue, and then psychosocial, she was grieving and probably had less emotional um, fortitude to deal with these issues at that particular time. And so going forward, we thought, how can we take this information that we've learned to fashion an intervention? So. In conclusion from what we've discussed, um, I would say first, it turns out that not all patients needed retention intervention. So even before we get there, as we look, most patients stay in care without additional help. There's a significant fraction who do need help. Um, number two, different fac patients face different barriers, and different barriers are more prevalent across sites. Individual patients face multiple barriers, and the rate-limiting barrier is not clear. So if you take the example of the previous um, patient, if you remove any one of those issues, she probably would have stayed in care, but you don't know on a population level which one of those issues is the most important. So the implications are that if you want to do an intervention, that blanket inter application of any intervention squanders resources on patients who do not need help, yet only helps some patients in need. Existing interventions known to be efficacious therefore have small effects and, and are potentially inefficient. So there have been three interventions in resource-limited settings that have um, that have um, shown efficacy in randomized trials. Counseling, navigation, sorry, four, text messages, and, and vouchers, so transportation vouchers. Um, so no single intervention is optimally effective and efficient, and there is not and never will be a silver bullet. So this is the last, oh, sorry, there's two more, but um, I'll summarize. Um, public health interventions for retention have not to date exploited a novel approach, sequential adaptive strategies that deal with effectiveness and efficiency simultaneously. So uh, this, this um, such a strategy, you start with a less expensive, uh, inter maybe less efficacious intervention, and then you um, apply only a more costly and intensive one in situations where you need it. This main minimizes expenditures for patients who are already um, sufficiently retained, therefore optimizing efficiency, but intensifies support for those who need additional help, therefore optimizing effectiveness. And the way that you come up with the best approach, the best adaptive approach, is through a sequential multiple assignment randomized trial. Susan Murphy is a statistician at the University of Michigan who has um, uh, came up with this design and recently won a MacArthur um, for it. And it's been, it's been applied in, in many uh, behavioral and, and psychiatric conditions for which there is no um, silver bullet solution. And we felt like it fit well with this problem. Um, so I won't go into the details here, but um, suffice it to say that patients are randomized to lower level interventions. Those who are, succeed are maintained um, or withdrawn, and then those who fail um, are randomized to different escalating uh, interventions. Um, and and um, so this is where we hope to take uh, the next step. Um, in, and I just wanted to end with, uh, again, a round of thank yous to um, various folks at UCSF, um, at UC Berkeley, Maya Peterson, um, who's a co-investigator with me on the sequential multiple assignment randomized trial, and others in Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and uh, elsewhere. So many thanks. Thank you so much. And um, Jim Kahn's name had been mentioned earlier today, and unfortunately he is still in Kenya, but we are very, very fortunate that one of his partners in crime, uh, Dr. Elliot Marseille, will be here to present the work that they've been doing together 
um, Elliot is the principal of the firm Health Strategies International, which specializes in the economic evaluation of global health programs. He's trained as a policy analyst, and he's worked extensively on empirical and modeled assessments of cost effectiveness of services, programs, and policies related to HIV and AIDS. He was the director of the program called PANSEA, which is, spells or stands for Prevent AIDS Network for Cost Effectiveness Analysis, the largest HIV prevention cost study to date. He is currently a consultant to a number of uh, countries in a um, number of areas, including diabetes and including the fourth generation of HIV tests. So, Elliot? Thank you. Thank you, Claire. As Claire mentioned, uh, my job is to channel Jim as best I can. And this is California, so you're allowed to channel. <laughs> so let's, let's see how I do. Uh, I'm charged with reviewing the progress in global health over the last couple of decades, an impossible task. Um, but I'm going to uh, make an attempt to summarize a couple of important trends. Uh, and I'm going to use uh, the 1993 World Bank World Development Report to bookend one end of that 20-year 20, uh, 20 span and to use the recently published Lancet Commission 2003, uh, excuse me, 2013 report just came out in December to bookend the other, uh, the other end of this. Some of the authors of um, either or both works are here. Um, so I'm on the hot seat to present this uh, accurately. Um, I would say that uh, one of the important contributions of the uh, initial 1993 WDR report was that it made important progress in quantifying disease burden and really brought to prominence that uh, concept um, largely through the promulgation of the idea of disability-adjusted life years to measure disease burden. Um, it thus strengthened the role of economic evaluation in guiding policy, so generally strengthened the status and importance, recognized importance of economic analysis and its role in, uh, in the formulation of policy. It was also important in establishing the links between investments in health and economic uh, growth in general. So it had long been acknowledged that you increase economic status, and you're going to get increases in health status. And I think that one of the things that the WDR 1993 report was to uh, offer that the causal direction moves in the other direction also, that investments in health are one of the most powerful ways that you can increase uh, economic development. And it thus broke down some of the silos between investments in health and sort of general economic development. Um, along similar lines, it emphasized links between investments in health and um, economic growth, which I already mentioned, but specifically investments in education and rights for women as being one of the most potent um, uh, contributors to increases in health status and also to economic development. It advocated for improved spending in health because it was so efficacious, both for increasing health status, of course, but also had these powerful secondary effects. And as an extension of that, the importance of intersectoral connections between investment in health and water supply and sanitation, institutional legislative action, um, and was prescient, I think, in emphasizing the importance of clean technologies uh, in promoting health. So last month, we saw the other end of this bookmark, which was the publication of the Lancet Commission 2013 report. Um, it is extensive. This is not a complete summary of that report, but I do think it touches on some of the main contributions of that report. It documents the productivity uh, gains from investing in health, but promotes a more inclusive measure of the benefits of increase in health status. So they're not confined merely to the increased productivity of people who are now returned to higher uh, uh, states of health and states of functioning, but introduced a concept 
that is more inclusive in capturing the benefits of increased in health status, and I refer specifically to the promulgation of the concept of, um, of full, full life years gained and all of the implications, not just for productivity, but the value of health itself. Uh, it promoted the idea of uh, universal health coverage to protect the poor, acknowledging that one of the great impoverishing events for people in poor country are health shocks, and that therefore providing protection to the poor from those health shocks um, is important both for health and for poverty alleviation. It confronted the rise of uh, non-communicable diseases, which was less pronounced 20 years earlier when the 1993 report came out and outlined a strategy for dealing with NCDs, uh, emphasized the role of fiscal policy in a way that hadn't been done as uh, strongly or, or completely, um, the power of taxes and subsidies to promote health in population. And all of this was presented under a grand sort of overarching idea of convergence in health. Convergence here meaning the, uh, the uh, decrease in the gap between the health status of developing low-income low countries and, and uh, uh, upper, upper uh, lower-income countries, the possibility of their converging in health status to uh, middle and even upper middle-income countries and set that out as the grand goal to be achieved by the year uh, 2013 excuse me, 2035. So uh, in keeping with the idea of integrating health, uh, investments in health with other sectors of economic development, those of us who are working within the field of global economics are also looking for ways in which we can interdigitate our work, create synergies between uh, the different areas or the different sub-disciplines of health economics. And here at UCSF, we've started a working group for response to the new, very effective and very expensive uh, new uh, uh, hepatitis C treatments that have come online literally within the last three to six months. So when I say very effective, I'm talking about cure rates in the area of 80, 90 percent, even higher highly tolerated, very, uh, very favorable side effect profile. One pill a day, there's just one catch. The pill costs $1,000 a day. So the, and for a 12-week uh, course of treatment. So roughly, including the medication and other adjuncts to treatment, $100,000 for, for a cure. So this raises extremely important issues uh, that touch on many aspects of global health economics and challenge us to think about how we might rapidly maximize access to these new therapies, both in developing countries and in, in rich countries like, uh, like the United States. Um, what are the lessons that can be learned about the dramatic reduction in the cost of HIG, HIV medications? Uh, can we accelerate such a, a dramatic reduction in the price of uh, hepatitis C medications in developing countries. Uh, so we're putting together a multidisciplinary team of UCSF researchers that include us uh, economic types, but uh, more importantly, or as importantly, clinicians, uh, pharmacists, people within the economics that aren't just doing cost-effectiveness research but are interested in manpower issues, expert on finance, uh, and also uh, behavioral economics. What are the implications of the burgeoning new field of behavioral economics on how one would increase access to these new therapies? So we're, we're excited about this nascent um, research agenda. Another area where we've been active here at UCSF, but also in other centers, is to try to address the question of whether we can develop accessible, user-friendly, but still accurate enough models for uh, thinking about the allocation of scarce global health resources. And here at UCSF, we've developed one such model called Global Health Decisions. Um, and it is a 
it focuses on HIV, and it is a web-based, uh, user-friendly interface uh, that our team here has worked on over the last uh, few years. I don't have time to explain the model in detail, but you can see on the panels on the left, uh, uh, the user has an opportunity to increase the coverage for HIV testing or condom social marketing or on the top medical male uh, 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 super, uh, circumcision. And it brings together the best available data on effectiveness, cost, and epidemiology, including the specification of different risk subgroups. So the idea is to bring these disparate areas of knowledge uh, and information together in one model that can inform policy uh, rapidly, easily, um, but still in a way that does justice to the complexity and, and nuance of trying to uh, project the impact of various implementation scenarios. Uh, another area where we at UCSF have been working and, I, and other collaborators elsewhere is in trying to make the results of economic appraisal more policy relevant. Um, and we want to do that by moving away from uh, a standard which has become in vogue over the last few years, which basically says if an intervention is uh, uh, costs per life year saved, one time per capita GDP or perhaps three times per capita GDP, it's cost effective and therefore from an economic point of view should be implemented. We think this ignores various context setting specific issues that need to be taken into account, such as affordability, the relative cost effectiveness of a set of interventions, all of which may meet that threshold, but may have very uh, different cost effectiveness ratios. It also doesn't take into account certain constraints. Um, so this is another area where we're beginning, we're beginning to work. Um, all of this is under the overall direction of an informal group called the uh, called Geekon, pun intended, um, and the 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 mission of Geekon is uh, to Im increase the impact of public health and clinical science using state of the art economic analysis, um, and to do so in as collaborative a way as possible to attract, bring in as many people who are interested in the role of economic analysis can see the importance of economic analysis in the work they're doing. And a number of the speakers today have touched on those issues. So that's, so that's encouraging. Um, and uh, uh -huh, my last slide isn't here. That's OK. That pretty much covers it. So <laughs> it worked out OK. Thank you. Very good, thanks Elliot. Um, and I think because we're running late, um, I'm gonna ask those of you with questions for, for any of the speakers, including the last uh, panel, uh, to grab them uh, outside. You'll have plenty of opportunities over the, the lunch and poster viewing uh, uh, time. Before we break for lunch, um, I've been promising something uh, special. Uh, this, uh, this past year, uh, Global Health Sciences, for the first time, invested um, uh, pilot grant support through the RAP mechanism at UCSF uh, for pilot uh, grants uh, in global health uh, policy and basic science research. Um, and we had a, a large number of applicants, and the RAP process uh, allowed us to take our two investments and, and end up with four awardees. Uh, in these, so I wanted to uh, invite up uh, our four uh, RAP awardees. Um, you've heard from some of them so far. Uh, so uh, Drew uh, Kazi, um, but Melissa Morgan, uh, Michelle Boyle, and Gioti Mishra. If you're all here, could you come down to the front? And I'd like to acknowledge. I'm hurrying too much, <laughs> stepping on the applause. Um, I have a, a summary of their research. I'll, I'll, again, spare you that. But, but 
congratulations uh, to all of you, and it was really great uh, looking at your, uh, at your proposals. And I want to have you stay up here, because uh, we're going to do some photos later, OK? So stay right there. And then um, <laughs> the next awardee, uh, you've, already, uh, you've already met. I'm looking around the room. There you are. <laughs> Dabrowski Herbert uh, is the recipient of this year's uh, Burke Family uh, Scholarship. Uh, the Burke Family, and we have Kathy Burke here. Raise your hand there. Uh, <laughs> Kathy and Bob have been very generous supporters of the, of the glo of global health at UCSF of Global Health Sciences. Kathy is herself a a product of the Global Health Master's Program, and, and, and we're proud of her and thankful for the support that you've given <laughs> people like Susan Mefford, who have been a, a, a Burke uh, scholar as well. Uh, this year, I think you couldn't help but s see why we chose uh, Dabrowski um, out of a, I have to say, out of a finalist candidate pool that was spectacular, uh, but his enthusiasm, um, really this, this love of hookworms, uh, it just hit us in the heart. So, uh, Dabrowski, you want to come up here as well? Thank you. Thank you. So, this is the future of global health at UCSF. We're really proud of you, and we're there to help you succeed in, in your career. So, thank you very much. And again, stay around. Okay.